Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, folks. A little choked up here. Um, uh, what, a, what a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce a man who needs no introduction, um, Moshe Lobel. Moshe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Please also welcome Sharon Azrielli. Sharon, where are you? In the bathroom. <laughs> All right, that's a new one. Um, uh, we'll stall. Um, uh, got, got any good Yiddish jokes? No. Not, not the mood after that ending. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, this beautiful film and for being here. It's really, um, uh, really one of the most beautiful films I've seen in a while. Uh, artistically, cinematically, the story just comes together so beautifully. And I have a lot of questions, but I also want to give an opportunity for everybody here in the audience to ask questions too. So I'll start with a few, if that's OK. And then, uh, of course, uh, Sharon will join us uh, when she comes. Uh, back uh, now that she's been outed here. I wonder if she missed the ending. <laughs> uh, <laughs> still may hope. Maybe hard to watch. Um, le let me start by asking just, I mean, this is uh, such a big, let's talk about the story. Do you, wh where did the story come from? Uh, Adi Walter, who wrote and directed this, um, he has been kind of obsessed with this idea of, uh, well, he you know, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of Holocaust movies out there. Um, a couple of them that are, you know, very popular and uh, all of them take place during or after the destruction. Um, and what ends up happening is uh, these people end up being defined by their tragic demise. And, you know, y you're seeing them at their worst. You're seeing them in, in ghettos and, and concentration camps. And for Adi, it was really important to show, give them life and show what was taken from them. Um, and that's what, um, that's what really uh, impressed me when I was approached about the project was that this, I'd never seen anything like this before. I'm fascinating. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this, too. Um, this is, um, I, I, I mean, it, it is rare that you get to see the human stories of the life before. It's rare to see the shtetl life represented anywhere. I mean, we've all seen Fiddler on the Roof. Anybody here not see Fiddler on the Roof? Is that possible? A couple of cast members here, <laughs> actually. So. Um, but it's really, it, it's really a, a, a part, a, it was a huge part of Jewish life that has disappeared. And the, the other important element of it is that it's, it's not just about showing this kind of exotic Jewish life is, um, you know, the way Adi wrote it and, and the way we developed it was, these are very modern characters. I mean, they're, they're, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and, and, you know, some of them are still alive and they deal with many of the same questions and the same problems. Um, just human things that we deal with, and they're very relatable. It's not some like uh, you know they're not some uh, fairy tale characters. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's it's very true. It's something that I that I didn't think about as as I was watching it. That yes, especially there's that one moment towards the end where the music even gets a little more modern. Yeah, that was I was actually thinking about it tonight because I never we'd never talked about this at any of the Q and A's, but. Uh, when we did the the dancing at the um, on that scene in the in the woods, um, he actually uh, Adi wanted it to be really contemporary. Uh, we we played like techno music on the set while we were doing it, um, and I think they opted for something a little in between for the soundtrack. But uh, yeah, the idea was to kind of show they're they're just kids, you know, like anybody now who's trying to make a life. Um, wonderful, Sharon. Let me bring you into this. Um, you you played um, uh, Yona's mother. Is that uh, yeah. that's I, I recognized you there yeah. for a moment. Yeah, um, that was great. And you also produced the the film. Or I was one a of the producers. very very small producer. Yeah, one of one of many. And I'm very important. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it, uh, she also uh, well, it was cut off. But when you watch it next time, make sure you watch the credits with the music. Oh, I and was wondering her about that. Wonderful yeah. voice is uh, yeah, in it I'm as well. I'm a singer, so. I was hoping that that was a, okay, so normally you would hear 
Yeah, song? of course. Okay. Yeah. It's the first time I've seen the movie. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, impactful. In yeah. <laughs> definitely impactful. Yeah, very, yeah. Um, how did you get? In, how did you both get involved? Let me start with Sharon for this. Um, that's a really good question. I actually can't remember. I've had a 30-year career as an opera singer. And um, so I think one of, one of the other producers that's a friend of mine uh, told me about the project and asked me if I wanted to get involved. And I said, yes, but I, I really want to, you know, I want to get into acting. And, and then I spoke to Jean Charles, who's the, the, you know, who created the whole project. And he said, okay. Magician who made this Yeah, who happen. made this all happen. Okay, I have a small part for you. And I said, okay, I, I want to do anything. I want to get, you know, involved in this. And he said, okay, but it's in Yiddish. I'm like, oh, okay. My Yiddish isn't great. But I, I worked also uh, for a, a few years as a cantor. So it, it, it all, just all the pieces came together. And how did you get involved, Mark Uh I did a play in 2017 off Broadway, uh, uh, Awake and Sing. It's Clifford or that's not a musical. Um, uh, in Yiddish. That was my first professional uh, stage production. And um, there was a French Yiddishist who was involved like peripherally in that production. Um, and we worked together like kind of, uh, you know, not, not so closely, but uh, for, for a year or so. And then she moved back to Paris and I never really heard from her again. And then one day, uh, just after I finished Fiddler uh, in the beginning of 2020, uh, I get an email from her uh, that she was she was originally going to consult for this, um, and she met Adi in Paris, uh, the director who's French. Um, and yeah, that's just, uh, she made a very strong recommendation. <laughs> that's, yeah, fabulous. Um, let me ask, this is, this is really one of the more intriguing parts of the film, the set. Um, how how was this world created? How was uh, this shtetl created? And share a little bit about how you worked with this set. Yeah, I mean, there are some places in Ukraine, there's even a set that they can use for villages, but uh, it was very clear uh, once Adi decided, well, actually he decided very early on um, about this the single sequence um, thing. I wouldn't say sh single shot because there are actually many shots in it. They're just invisible, uh, the cuts are just invisible. Um, but it was important to have a set that is specifically made for this story and the way it was gonna be filmed. So uh, this the work started like six or seven months before filming where we all, uh, the lead cast, um, the uh, cinematographer and the uh, set designer all got together in Kiev, and we started developing this, and they really planned through every moment of this film, um, together with the actors as we were developing uh, that as well. Um, but it was also just an incredible uh, set to have. I mean, it was so rich, and I think one of the m one of the most scariest things for me coming into this film was that I'd never. I, I've led a play before, I'd led like a short film before, but I'd never done anything like this. And this, even for like, even for an experienced like lead actor, is insane, like, you know. Um, and I I knew that I would have, and you know, when I have scene partners, I'm, I'm okay, because I have other people to work with in the, uh, but I was like, what do I do when I'm walking from here to here, or whatever, but like the, the, the set was so rich that that was like another scene partner. Um, it was so immersive. Uh, I would just, we would drive uh, an hour from Kiev every day and I would leave my phone in Kiev and uh, I would just enter the shtetl and we would, like during breaks, I would hang out at the river, like on that bridge that we see in the beginning. It was really like uh, an insane immersive experience. Um, yeah, and, and I should mention though that uh, speaking of the set, uh, I mean this film, th there's a lot of Yiddish in it, but you should know this is a very much a Ukrainian film. I mean, the the. C can I just say? Yeah. So this land was donated by the, by the city, to the the set to the production, and and in exchange the production gave 
built an entire shtetl. Actually, all the all these buildings were built. They're actually life size. They're they're true houses. So each person, had the house of your father, the house, the, the the synagogue is an actual reproduction of a of a true what a, a synagogue would have been. So. Uh, if you've ever been to the, the Jewish Museum in Poland, in Warsaw, Polin, there is also there a, um, a genuine um, replica of, of a 19th century synagogue. And this synagogue was exactly like that, correctly. The, the proportions were correct, the, the paintings were correct. It's, it was actually beautiful. It was terrible to be in the women's section because <laughs> you really were on the side. You really couldn't see, it was awful. But, but that shot, by the way, mm -hmm. of uh, where it pans across, yeah, the w that's one of my really favorite really moments beautiful. of the whole film. Uh, it was awful to be there. Because yeah, I can imagine. Cycling, you couldn't <laughs> yeah, be. It's very hot, but, um, too. And, and, um, and um, the land is gorgeous, as, as you say, but all of the buildings are, are correct. You could actually be in them, like when we were in the women's scene, and we had to redo that several times and waiting. There was place for the women to sit. There were actually rooms. Um, and, and I don't know if you were about to say, but we do know now that um, we had donated that land. They were gon going to keep it as a museum. Kiev was going to keep it as a museum uh, of a synagogue and of a, sh of a shtetl to be visited by the Ukrainian people. However, now we have learned that it's been mined by the Russians. Yeah, so that whole area is pretty. I mean, we know thankfully yeah. that it's still standing. It's still uh, they standing, sent but it's been mined. A drone. It was a whole operation. They had to. So uh, yeah. it, nobody can access it now. Yeah. So, um, but but it really was an incredible experience to be to be walking around there and yeah. to be. And I just I, I just want to say about the you know the Ukrainian angles that that, that um, most of the crew is Ukrainian and a lot a large part of the cast, uh, but all of the designers were and not Jewish. Uh, but they were so passionate about it, and they did an incredible amount of research um, in, in and found like these props from all over Ukraine and abroad, and uh, and hand painted. Uh, Yulia, the, the art director, hand painted that synagogue. I mean, it was an extraordinary effort from that team. Amazing. Um, I have a lot, m many more questions, but I'm going to ask one more because I want to give our audience a, an opportunity. Um, the cast, um, both the extras that were there, where where did all these uh, these people come from? It looks like there was a whole community of uh, um, people from the early 1900s living there, and I mean, I'm especially curious, of course, about the children. But uh, but where where did that uh, cast come from? It was a big mix of people. I mean, that so the principal cast uh, was from all over. Um, we had people. Saul Rubin, I and I were Canadian. Yeah, <laughs> Canada. We had from Israel. We had from Poland. We had from a lot from Ukraine, of course. Um, and uh, as far as the extras, it was interesting because they, they went to the Jewish community in Kiev and um, a lot of people I think brought a lot of them were, were yeah. from Kiev. Um, and they also had Ukrainian stuff. Um, and what's also interesting is if you listen, if you listen when you're watching, there's also a lot of sa background sound, a lot of Yiddish and uh, Ukrainian, uh, which they also did like separately with Yiddish groups. It was like, uh, and, and yeah, there are a lot of, people and voices in this film. Fabulous. Um, this is your chance. I'll, I'll keep going here, but um, I, I see a hand up, and uh, we're going to pass you a microphone right there. Hi. Um, can you tell me about the shifts between black and white? Like, I know they're, you know, morning and evening entrances, exits. Can you describe that and the choice to make? Um, well, the black, the colors, uh, he, so Adi chose to do the opposite of uh, what's usually done. Uh, the col the, the, um, the flashbacks are in color and the present day is in black and white. Um, I mean, you can kind of explain it, uh, that's kind of up to the inter interpretation, but it's basically like you have a bright, and colorful future in the past, and now this world is slowly disappearing. Um, and the synagogue was the one exception to that rule because we just wanted to show how beautiful it was. Yeah. I, I was wondering if that one was. You can explain it away, but it's uh, it's just really to show. Your your character, of course, is in a moment there. Yeah. So of course. You could take it in different directions. <laughs> Any 
Uh, anyone else? We have a question right here. I'll pass you the mic. Thank you. It's a great film. Thank you. Um, question: How did the cast handle all the Yiddish? Um, <laughs> did, was anybody a natural so speaker? Mo Mo Moshe is, a, I think, a native Yiddish speaker, yeah. and so is Saul. So thank God for that. Me, I was so lucky because we had, well, Lily Rose, Li yeah. Lily, who was, Lily uh, was, was the a cultural a consultant and coach on unorthodox th as well. Thank God. So yeah. Lily was was there every day, coaching and coaching and. And she sent me a tape too uh, uh, before. So, and luckily, I, I mean, I have some Yiddish in my background, right? But just choice words like schmendrick, you know, and <laughs> schlep. I could hear the laughs of recognition tonight in this audience. It's interesting. And, and you know, it, what, it, what's amazing is I could follow, I can follow everything and I can understand, but uh, I could never have done a long monologue like you did. I, for me, it was really hard to just do my tiny little scene. I had to do Ukrainian, so I understand I, your pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. I'm like so impressed. So, so that was my question. How, we, how did you manage the Ukrainian there? Uh, I had a, another uh, Ukrainian coach who helped me. I also, um, I traveled quite a bit in Ukraine before uh, when I was preparing for this role. So uh, it was important for me to uh, get a feel for the language and the dialects, not just in Ukrainian, but in Yiddish traveling to West Ukraine, which is a bit different. Um, it's more kind of Polish influence than the Russian influence on the other side. By the way, tell, tell everybody the role that Lily played too, because you wouldn't ever recognize. Right, yeah, uh, Lily Rosen played the um, Zisha, who talks about the uh, el electricity being uh, God, uh, which is an extraordinary uh, monologue. We do have another question up there. I'm going to ask in the meantime, as the microphones, uh, how many days was this shoot? How long did it take to shoot this film? I, uh, I think it was about six weeks all in all. I mean, we had a lot of rehearsal. We started with about two weeks of uh, on-set rehearsal. Um, and then while we were shooting, uh, the general thing was we would shoot half a day and rehearse half a day, unless it was a big scene, then we would do a full day. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of the flow. So um, I was interested in the music because I felt the music was so subtle in a way. There was a um, there was kind of a subtlety to it, so that it was there, but it was not there for me. It didn't overcome the the film; it just blended in beautifully. Yeah, I agree. Uh, this uh, David Federman is a is a French composer. Uh, he was actually on the set for a couple of weeks. Um, when I was preparing for the role, it was like, uh, before I even got to Ukraine the second time, I um, I was in Europe, I was in, in Paris, and I was trying to figure out, you know, you trying to figure out who this character is in the flesh and the mind, and then um, kind of the, the tone of the film, and I got to hear the the opening titles, themes, theme, and that then it just immediately clicked. And while we were filming, I actually worked. Uh, I got a lot of material from David. I would listen on the set, and um, I would, uh, I would. He would ask me for like. It was a very collaborative uh, thing, and we also had singing, so he was involved with that. Um, but yeah, it was <laughs> some days I would go to him and be like, "Do you have anything for me? Do you have, I need something new. I need something fresh. I need some new inspiration." And he always had something for me. So, yeah. Thank you for noticing that. Uh, how many people were actually in that shuttle? And was that what they were like uh, in terms of the community? You mean in, in reality? Like yeah. what? How many? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I guess it could be a couple hundred people. Uh, very small. Um, it's this, I, I think when they screened it in... Uh, Belgium, there was a whole argument, you know, when you're dealing with Jewish audiences, uh, there's always an argument. And yeah. uh, someone said, no, it shouldn't be a shtetl, it's a dorf, which is smaller. And I think they, there were some fists came out, yeah. So, but uh, it's, uh, it's very small. I mean, that's the center. What we see is the center. Uh, but there are, like, farm lands and, and houses beyond that as well. We're going to give you the microphone. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, we need it so it's recorded correctly. Oh, okay. yeah. I'll try to keep my 
What what imp what a performance. Thank you. What what impact in playing that role, that character? What impact did that have on you? Um, before, during, after, uh, given the fact that you're, a, you know, we learned that you're a native Yiddish speaker. In what way? Did, well, anyway, what was what, what kind of impact did it have? I mean, I so I, I grew up Hasidish and um, I broke away, and uh, for a long time, I completely rejected the culture and the language, and. When I discovered Yiddish theater a couple of years ago, I re reconnected with it. And in that process, started to reconnect with the culture and the community that I came from and really trying to deal with the question of identity. And like, because, you know, w when I was growing up, it was a very polar uh, kind of environment. You're either in or you're out. And what happens when you're you have one foot in one foot out and what you know someone like me who who recognized at some point that uh it is a big part of my identity uh it's not just my jewish identity but my specific experience and my community and my uh, history and um, i think that mendel deals with a lot of the same questions so it was really an extraordinary thing and um aside from that like i i don't think i would have had the impulse to go to ukraine and travel the places where my ancestors came from, um, if not for this. So that was another like extraordinary way that it impacted me. And I feel like, you know, both my experience influenced the character. Uh, for example, the, the the song that I sing in the synagogue, the prayer. That's something from my childhood, um, and vice versa. I think it, it really gave me a lot of. Uh, I wouldn't say clarity. I mean, I'll never have clarity. It's too complicated. But um, it definitely opened it up for me a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, folks, we're going to take one last question. Hi. I, I thought the, the film... Mm -hmm. I thought the film rang very true, except for... The mouse. You've got a shtetl. You've got these wooden houses. You've got fields all around. These girls would not have been afraid of a little white mouse. Why was that used as the... I am not privy to the specific relationship that they had in that region with uh, rodents, so I can't answer that question. Uh, but thank you for pointing it out. I'd, lo I'd love to say that is the greatest compliment you could give to a film. We're, <laughs> we're the only thing of a period piece that did not completely ring true was a mouse that was put through there. I, I never thought of that. that that's, that's a good point. I, that's we should cancel the distribution of this <laughs> film. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so that's yeah. right. Like, where where does it go from here? This is such um, a, this really this film's a treasure. Everyone thank should be you. seeing this. So, um, <laughs> so we we don't have like a large studio behind us and uh, or like a global distributor. Uh, it's kind of a market by market thing, um, and they're looking at uh, releasing it in uh, various markets uh, in the last quarter of this year. Um, however, um, you know, it, it, there are going to be a bunch of screenings uh, at festivals and, you know, preview screenings like this. Um, and actually, you guys, like, audiences, these audiences are really important because what happens is the, you know, this is how we convince distributors to uh, take us on and to take risks. I mean, any, a studio film... Uh, the conventional wisdom is uh, a film has to spend as much money as it did on making the film, on selling it. You you know, if you make a $50 million movie, you're spending $50 million at least on on, promotion, on promoting it. We don't have that. So so <laughs> what can this audience do? Um, so it's just a, a question of uh, really going, you know, spreading word of mouth, you know, posting on social media, uh, writing reviews on wherever review websites you, you use, you know, like 
letterboxed or, or just reviewing it, rating it on IMDb, whether it's a two or a 10 or an eight, whatever you want. Um, but it's, it's important that kind of engagement uh, can really, uh, because we can get a couple of nice critic, critical reviews, um, but that doesn't necessarily Even about mean the mouse. <laughs> you can write about the mouse. I mean, any, any kind of, honestly, that, that kind of engagement is really important. Um, so please shout uh, and tell all your friends. But th there would have been no other way to get them out of the house. We needed to get Yuna. I know, I, I, had, I actually had never thought about that. <laughs> H Hitchcock used some other devices sometimes to move people. I think this worked well. Um, but, but folks, do spread the word about this. Tell all your friends. I don't know if a movie about a shtetl is something that everybody should go, is gonna go see automatically, but everybody should see this film, and there's so much to relate to there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, coming. folks. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the beautiful film. Thank you all for joining us. I should note that in May, we're gonna be screening here um, a live, I was gonna say a Yiddish film, but it's actually a silent film from the Yiddish age oh. um, with live orchestration. Which one? Um, I, I forget at the moment, <laughs> um, but uh, stay tuned for that as well if uh, that's your draw into all of this. Thank I you all, you know and have I'd a good night.